Hello and welcome to The Drum. I'm Dan Borshi coming to you from the lands of the Ghana people here in Adelaide. Here's Uncle Frank Wanganin welcoming us to his country. Nai Tampadi Tawila Brikiana, Nai Tampadi Bamba Valiarendi, Ghana Yurtiana, Matachianga Ghana Miona, Nai Wangadi Mani Nai Budni, Ghana Yurtiana, Tandanyanga Wadliana. I just want to acknowledge our ancestors, also recognise where we old and event is on Ghana country. And on behalf of the Ghana people, I just want to welcome you all to Tandanyanga, the place of the red kangaroo. And I tell you, thank you. We're in Adelaide tonight for a special edition of The Drum and what a spectacular space we're in right now. This is the Circulating Library as part of the State Library of South Australia Complex and thank you to the team here for making us all so welcome tonight. Well, it's about three weeks until Australia will go to the polls to vote on the Voice to Parliament referendum. The Yes campaign formally launched here recently with the Premier Peter Malinowskis noting that Adelaide was also the location for the launch of the successful 1967 referendum. Now, voice proponents and critics view South Australia as a crucial battleground state that could make or break their campaigns. We'll be discussing the voice later in the program, but first let's introduce our panel for tonight. Welcome for the first time, Gugatha Elder Sue Hazeldean. Thank you for flying in. Great to have you along. Thank you for having me. Also, uh, strategic advisor to the Uluru Dialogue and former public servant, Kirsty Parker. Welcome back. Thank you. For the first time as well, businessman and managing director of the Bend Motorsport Park, Sam Shaheen. Welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. And senior reporter at The Guardian Australia, friend of the drum, Tori Shepherd. Always great to have you along. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Uh, and you can join us uh, as well watching online. First tonight, uh, to the management of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's been over three years since COVID-19 arrived on our shores, forever disrupting life as we knew it. Now the federal government has announced an independent inquiry to investigate the COVID response and report back in 12 months. We need to examine what went right, uh, what could be done better with a focus on the future. Because the health experts and the science tells us that this pandemic uh, may well be, indeed is not likely to be the last one. Uh, we need a future made in Australia. We need to be more resilient. We need to be more prepared uh, for this in the future. And that's precisely what this inquiry will be aimed at. Epidemiologist, economist and lawyer will lead the inquiry which will focus specifically on the Commonwealth response. This includes the procurement of vaccines, treatments and medical supplies, mental health support, financial support for individuals and businesses, as well as assistance for Australians abroad as well. But it won't focus on the unilateral decision made by states or territories. The federal opposition has slammed the approach, saying any probe should include the states, given they were in charge of implementing lockdowns as well as closing schools. I think the Prime Minister has made a deliberate decision to put the interests of Labor premiers ahead of our national interest, uh, and that is a shameful act from a Prime Minister who's been elected by the Australian people to provide support and uh, to lead the whole nation. It should cover... Uh, every state uh, and it should cover the Commonwealth and that's what the Prime Minister promised uh, and now he's gone back on his word again. The announcement comes as epidemiologists warn a new highly mutated COVID variant BA286 nicknamed Parola has been detected in Australia. Tori I want to start with you because this isn't a royal commission with all of the special powers that come with that. Now that's something that that a number of people were calling for. The three investigators have only got 12 months. Is this the right approach to investigate such a consequential moment for our country in, this, in the frame of this global picture? Look, I do understand the need to pull back that time frame to just have a year because we don't know when the next mutant yeah. or when the next pandemic indeed is coming. So I totally get the need for speed. And we have seen a lot of inquiries and studies already done on the other hand, I am a little baffled about leaving out some of those state decisions. Um, and I think a lot of the Australian people would really like to hear why there were so many inconsistencies between the states and see how that then folds into a national plan so that the next time this happens, there are processes and procedures in place and people have more 
trust and knowledge of what the outcomes are going to be and what's going to happen to them. Yeah, well, on that point about the states and territories, Peter Dutton, the opposition leader, calls it a protection racket for state premiers. Decisions made at state level won't be right. It's a pretty blunt way of Peter Dutton putting it, isn't it? It is a really blunt way of putting it. But at the same time, I would hate to see this get bogged down in, you know, bashing up Daniel Andrews or whatever, when what we really need to be doing is, is coming up with a plan. By the way, we did have a plan, actually. We had a 2019 pandemic plan uh, that talked about aged care homes, cruise lines, uh, dangers of transmission with poor air quality control and so on. So we had a plan and it seems that we didn't follow it. So what I'd really like to see then is a commitment to something that will then be triggered as soon as the next pandemic happens so we don't have a lot of this faffing about. I think there's a forgivable amount of faffing about when the science was changing and we were still trying to work out what was going on. But at the same time, I was really surprised at how unprepared we were for this pandemic. Mm. Uh, today, we've heard from the, the shadow health minister saying that it's a witch hunt against the former government. Is that the sense you got? Well, no, it's not really, because what uh, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese was emphasising was that this is about the future. This is working, working out what went wrong so we can do it better. And if it was going to be a witch hunt, there were still some Liberal premiers maybe you could go after as well. So that's not the sense that I got. I hope it doesn't turn into that. From the sounds of the panel, you've got some, some great expertise mm. there and some very evidence-based, scientifically focused people who hopefully will just say, this is how we need to do it better next time. Mm. Uh, so part of the focus of this is going to be the impact of COVID-19 on First Nations people. And we know that particularly for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living in remote communities, there was real concern. When you reflect back over that couple of years' time, how do you think about the response from the government? Was it what, what you needed in your community? Well, um, you know, the crackdowns and everything happened and stopped Australia moving pretty well. But we, you know, I got COVID, but it didn't rule us because we were in the country, so we had more freedom, I guess. We isolated but we were still able to go to the beaches. And same with other Aboriginal people too. We were still able to move about without contacting other people. So I guess we got out of the, you know, the lockdowns quite easy because we, I respected it, COVID, and was wary of it, but it didn't scare us. Mm. And being free, freer than the city people, we, we cope better, I think. You must have been looking at, at family, at friends in the cities and, and really feeling for them, knowing how, that you were having such a different experience. Yes. Um, you know, when family got the COVID in Sejuna, we actually did the what we called COVID food runs. Mm. Some of us would go and do the shopping and then community drop, coming it, together, <laughs> eh? drop it off at the front gate, you know, not without touching anybody else. And you know, we did things like that. And I think we, the country people coped really well. Mm. Kirsty, there's, there's a powerful point there, isn't there, about even in amongst so much uncertainty, people were coming together and, and we can't lose sight of that as part of this whole story. Mm, absolutely, Dan. And I was working um, within the COVID response within Aboriginal communities, but from a government perspective. Mm. And I have to say the way that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people cared for each other, were concerned for each other, was incredible. But I also want to draw attention to, and it was a very exceptional situation, we had governments not um, being prepared, and perhaps understandably so, as Tori has said, but um, there was a level of concern that was led by our community-controlled Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health organisations. And um, they spoke to government and perhaps in an exceptional way, government said, we need to hear from you because this is really serious. Um, you know, our community-controlled health organisations um, recommended that there be consideration of community lockdown. So obviously there was restriction of movement within metropolitan areas, but we did see about a dozen Aboriginal communities opt in to community closures under the, commu uh, sorry, the Commonwealth Biosecurity Act. And that caused a bit of angst in communities because, of course, you know, our people have got long memories of the times when our movement was restricted under past um, discredited policies. But our community leaders stepped up and said, we can't muck around with this um, because Aboriginal people bear triple the burden of chronic ill health. We are especially vulnerable to this um, disease that we know very little about and we're going to take care of things. And um, it's been observed that although 
people were very fearful about the impact within our communities because of those measures that our community controlled organisations led. Our people, who were extraordinarily vulnerable, suffered only one fifth the level of infections that the rest of the population did, which was remarkable. It was exceptional though because um, governments themselves did not assume that they knew what would work in our communities and our community organisations came to the fore and it paid off. Yeah, we saw that on, on every level, including uh, federally. Uh, Arnie Pat Turner was there almost every day. You would see uh, her in the media talking about the specific risk to really vulnerable communities. How much do you think that this panel needs to be thinking about lessons from those experiences? Oh, I think um, it should be absolutely top of mind. And I'm very pleased that there is an inquiry happening because... And I don't think it's a witch hunt. Um, and as Tori pointed out, you know, um, it's, this, is, this cannot become political. It has to be about the health and safety of every single Australian. And I would hope that um, people will lean into this. It's not about being defensive. It's about saying this was a matter of life and death and we need to do, to do whatever we can should we be in that same unfortunate situation down the road to do the very best we can by all Australians. Mm. Sam, is there a pressure point here about how much of this can be focusing on what went wrong and, and apportioning blame and how much can we learn for the, the next pandemic? It's a fine balance, isn't it? I feel we're getting to a point of the law of diminishing returns here. You know, we've, we've done COVID to bits. Uh, I think it's time we, we, we turn the, the discussion to a constructive one as to what can we do in the future. I think from a state point of view, uh, you know, the state fared relatively well along a longer continuum from, you know, what we used to term here, the, 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 the Republic of Western Australia and the, and the self-imposed restrictions uh, that that population lived under to the extreme uh, lockdowns in Victoria and the manner in which New South Wales under the leadership of Gladys Berejiklian dealt with the pandemic. South Australia dealt relatively well, you know, got a solid pass in the way we managed the pandemic here. Uh, I felt the, the government almost changed its approach halfway through 2021 in, in allowing more bureaucrats and administrators to make decisions rather than take advice and make decisions themselves. Uh, as I said, I'd like us to be focusing more on, a, on the consequences of the pandemic. I think we've learned the lessons of COVID and I, I'm not too sure having another inquiry and another 12 months is going to teach us much more than what we already know. There is a work from home culture to deal with. There is a, a, an entire generation that has lived through, if you were a 16 or a 17 year old in 2019, the last four years, formative years, are very, very different to what you and I experienced as 16, 17 or 20 year olds. And that is a generation I think we're gonna have to deal with the consequences of how they live in our society in the next two or three decades. Mm. And I guess one of something that was a real focus here was the broader border restrictions that were, were quite strict, but you didn't seem to have the outbreaks that other places had. So does that show that that is one policy lever that, that clearly that has a big impact? It did, uh, and it worked well, relatively well in South Australia. Um, uh, it, the, 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 the broader picture, the broader point that I think you... you you know, I'd link to what you're saying, is that I think the, the strength of the Federation was almost threatened, I felt, during the peak of the pandemic. You know, this is when everything is going well, it's high fives all around between state premiers and it's all very jovial and very amicable. But when push came to shove, I think that the states, in the, the states in the way they exerted their powers in an unprecedented fashion is, is the bit that I really think is worth questioning just so that we take the lesson from the next time there is a disaster, a natural disaster, or whatever the case might be. Unfortunately, there's likely to be one, whether it's a flood or a tsunami or an earthquake or whatever the case might be. I think there are lessons we can take broadly from the learnings from the pandemic. Uh, but to, uh, on the question you're posing, whether we need to go back and pull more of the COVID pandemic to pieces, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not quite convinced that is a... a, a a great use of resources and time over the next 12 months. Tori, one of the things that we saw that, that Sam was alluding there to was the National Cabinet and a different way of Premiers, Chief Ministers, the Federal Government working together. 
It also exposed pretty big vulnerabilities in our supply chain security, in our the way that we could get access to, to vaccines, to masks, to rat tests even. How much of that is what we need to be thinking about of our own kind of security system around that supply chain? We need to be thinking about this very carefully and we need an extended plan with a focus maintained on it. I think it's so easy to slip back into cl complacency. I mean, you know, no one's wearing masks anymore. People are barely getting tested. So there's complacency at that level. But you can also get this governmental complacency in this, again, the 2019 pandemic plan. Uh, it talked a lot about we need to have a stock of PPE gear. We need to have quarantine facilities that are kept up to date. You know, we need to have all these things. But how you get a government, you know, each year preparing its budget, putting money aside for something that is now out of sight, out of mind, because the next pandemic might not come for a while, while they're trying to fund hospitals and schools and, and so on. Maintaining that level of preparedness is, is really hard. We've seen how that goes with longer term issues like, say, climate change or the ageing population. It just drops off. Sam, you want to make a point? Here's a challenging thought. Uh, there, were, there were significant shortages, you know, go back to uh, hand sanitizers and mm. masks. I mean, we, we, that wasn't that long ago. Here's the challenging thought. If the shortages were in food supplies or water supplies, I mean, this is the real sobering reality here. You know, premiers exerted influence and power at a level unprecedented in our federation. Uh, can you imagine if there was food shortages in one of the states and the other states needed to hoard supplies for their own population, whether they would share those food supplies with the other states? I think that the Federation and the Commonwealth really, the, 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 the structure of the Commonwealth and how they dealt with the states, I felt was strongly under threat. That is a major learning, I think, for us as a nation to take forward for the next crisis that affects us. Even right. the apportioning of vaccines, I think, raised some eyebrows at some point. Yeah. Um, our Aboriginal Health Service at, back at Sejuna, we only had to mention that we would like to do a rats test and they made sure that we had everything we needed. They were absolutely fantastic, you know, providing us with the help to make sure we could keep keep above this pandemic. So, yeah, just thought I'd mention that health service because they deserve it. I think that, that's a great point and grounds us back uh, here where we are we're talking about South Australia, which is shaping up to be a crucial state in the upcoming referendum on the voice to parliament. As it stands, polling shows support for the voice uh, appearing to be waning in the state, with a majority of those polled opposed to the move. Appearing on Adelaide Talkback Radio this morning, the Prime Minister was asked about the public's perception of the campaign so far. What do you say to our listeners in the outer suburbs who are sort of rolling their eyes a bit, or worse, are, are annoyed by the, the, the amount of time and attention the voice has consumed? Well, we're a government that... Uh, can walk and chew gum at the same time. Last week, we passed our Housing Australia Future Fund. On uh, Tuesday, I was in Melbourne announcing the first of our uh, social housing accelerator, uh, $2 billion uh, that we're doing. Today, we're announcing here in Adelaide our inquiry into COVID. So we're getting on with a, a whole range of uh, work and activity uh, out there right across the spectrum. But at the same time, we're giving Australians the chance to do something that is unfinished business, as John Howard called it in 2007, which is to recognise our first Australians in our constitution. Kirsty, I wonder if uh, the, the gist of what the Prime Minister was being asked there about this focus, the, uh, whether there is anything else going on, is one of the challenges that the campaigns face, if there's a bit of voice fatigue going on? Uh, potentially, but by the same token, many Australians have not engaged with um, what's proposed with the First Nations voice to Parliament. Um, many Australians have not read the Uluru Statement from the heart. So... Um, you know, we get that Aussies are hurting and I know that we're going to have a conversation about the cost of living and the impact on um, all Australians, but it is really important that Australians focus at this time on the discussions that are being had um, and principally that they uh, listen to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I'm one of them. I'm a signatory to the Uluru Statement from the Heart and we have offered an overture or a gesture to the Australian people to um, respond and walk with us and also to pay attention to what we're saying. And um, I think Australians can 
focus on a number of issues at the same time. And I would suggest that right now, as people are now figuring out that the referendum is little over three weeks to go, um, that they might then engage with the substance of this issue. Not the political stuff, not the, um, you know, um, some of the terrible stuff that's been flying around, but go to the source, the Uluru Statement itself, um, and listen to what our people are saying. I am keen to talk about that kind of mental health component in a moment, but how do you think the campaign is going? Because there is a lot of noise, there's a lot of nastiness, there's also lots of perspectives that have arisen from within the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community and it's raised lots of truth-telling and talking about lots of other things that we maybe haven't done before as a nation. Um, yeah, I, to some extent that is true, but there are a um, great many of our people who have supported this from the very beginning. You know, we did some um, uh, research here for the Uluru Dialogue and we found that 83% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander support the voice. Um, some people who were entrenched know within our community of that very small minority have since said, I will be voting yes because I can tell the difference that this will make and I can understand the consequence of a no, not just on our communities but also our country. So um, this has been a um, bruising process and campaign. There's no doubt about that. And I have to say that I've been personally very surprised at some of the things that have been said. You know, we've seen walking back of, um, you know, established, well-established practices and respect for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We've seen some terrible um, slights aimed at people that are, have been campaigning for years. And in fact, our people have been asking for a hundred years for recognition and for Australia to see us. Um, I'm very sad that the um, debate has become so polarised and I hope that people will do as I say, go back to ground zero, which is the Uluru Statement, um, the gesture that has been made by our people to reach out across any divides and say we can do better and we can do it together. So how are you feeling about The Voice? I don't like The Voice. I don't trust The Voice. Um, you know, I, I look at The Voice as maybe another native title which has done nothing but divide, divide and conquer our people. And The Voice... I speak to the government people now. I've written letters to those people. You know, the Prime Minister and all. I've had no response. So why should I trust them with my life, my future, when they can't even respond to me now when I'm asking them, do I have the right to say no to protect country, the animals that live there? Is this voice going to actually give me that right to say no, not just say, well, we'll listen to you? because they don't listen to me now. So, uh, so what I'm really wanting is the right to say no, protect country, animals, culture, families, and then I'll listen to what the government has to say. But until then, the, it's, it's just like it's empty promises. OK, we'll listen to you, but we don't have to... Well, we'll hear you, but we don't have to listen to you sort of thing. You know, we don't have to do anything. We just, you tell us your problems and we don't have to do anything about it. Just say we heard. Um, Dan, obviously I have a very different perspective. I, um, but I also understand the level of cynicism um, that Sue is expressing here. And it is no surprise um, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, will have low levels of trust, that, um, you know, governments will do... Um, and pay attention to what we have to say. But I'm, um, I'm betting on our people. I'm backing our people because of the magnificence that was um, displayed during times of COVID, for example. I know the richness, um, you know, the wisdom, the courage and the dignity of our communities. And I feel that um, should this voice referendum be successful, um, governments will hear Australians saying, we want you to start listening to Aboriginal people and perhaps doing differently to what you've done before um, with people like Sue and others who felt that they weren't being heard. So, um, you know, understandable levels of cynicism, but I'm still extremely hopeful and optimistic um, and particularly paying attention to the sort of sentiment and the messaging that we saw on the streets last weekend when, you know, probably 250,000 Australians turned out and said, we support this voice, which says they're saying to the government, you need to start acting differently when you deal with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Yes, and I, 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 I do respect Sue's view. Yeah. I, I agree with that. They, they need to act differently towards us. 
but is this voice going to be the answer? What about our treaty that never... They didn't even mention that in the voice. The voice is unlikely to be the answer to everything um, no. and um, things won't change overnight, but when you listen to people who are impacted by decisions, you get better results. When you do something with what you hear, you get better results and that's what I'm hopeful about. Maybe, and I'm sorry that my mistrust of the government is very deep. Can I, can I ask you, where does that mistrust of the government come from? Childhood? Is, yeah. It's about the way you've been treated through yeah, your life. Yeah, and welfare and, you know, stealing us and all of that. So I actually quite don't like any of them. Mm, don't like them. Um, oh, and one thing I really want to make clear about this voice too is that my no is not supporting Peter Dutton. I don't want nothing to do with him because I don't like him either. What does your no mean? My no is Lydia's no. Lydia said a progressive no. So uh, the black sovereignty movement. Yeah, that's my no. What is the aim of, of that? What, what does that hope to achieve? The, uh, the, well, you know, people talk about treaty. The, uh, the aim should really be that we are, things are made for us, not the other way around. Like every time the government does a deal, it's always in favour of the government. You take these illuers, these... I call them illegal land, land, land use agreements. agreements. Yeah. That's just another way of taking our land from us. Well, you signed a deal. We paid you money. Get off the land. We'll mine it. We'll destroy it. Whereas, you know, I'm all out for anybody that is going to destroy the land, the animals, the culture, the families. I'm right against them and I'll fight them. I can, I can see your, re your reaction. This is, this is tough. This is, this is personal. Thank you for sharing that. Um, okay. With us, we are, we'll move on in a moment to the South Australia voice. But did you want to weigh in on that, Kirsty? Um, I do. Um, people forget that the Uluru Statement expresses three aspirations, um, and I don't understand how you know our people, who, as I say, are understandably cynical, how they think um, that we could be in a space where we could have the very calm and sensible conversations. Um, we would like to have about treaty unless there is a voice that provides a framework for these sorts of things. So the Uluru Statement um, has sequential aspirations and um, although people will talk about the different no's, I can tell you that those no's will um, talk down the voice that's proposed for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and it won't matter what the reasons are why people are voting no, the outcome is still the same, uh, which is why I am advocating for the voice and then for us as a nation to be able to have grown up conversations about all of the aspirations within our community, some of which Sue has very rightly raised. Just before we move on, Sam, I understand you haven't decided on your position. What, what would it take from the campaigns, the yes, the no, what's it going to take for, for them to convince you? Well, let's start with Let's start with some facts because that, that sets the scene to where we are now. This is the 45th referendum in this what, country. 44th. 44th referendum. Only eight, eight successful. We don't like to change the constitution. Eight, eight successful. 13 got the yes stick, but only eight were successful. Mm. So the success rate is under 20%. Less than one in five previous referenda have succeeded. So history is against a referendum of yes. So... The onus is on the proponents. So for me, as someone who's listening to the differing points of view, the onus is on the proponent of a proposition to showcase why this is great for our nation, and especially for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. I don't think there is a sane human on this land that would not concur with or that doesn't want to see a betterment for the life of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. If we, let's take that as a, as a given. I think anybody who's sane wants better life for everybody. Opponents, adversaries, have learned throughout history that they don't necessarily have to prove a case against. They just have to create some doubt. They just have to create some ambiguity about an outcome to say, well, you don't know what you don't know and better stick with what you know so this could...
could be bad. It might be good, but it might be bad. So the, the proponents have put the light on the subject of the voice, and I think they have a great responsibility to prove the case, if I can put it that way. And this is, this is the bit that I've, I've, I've struggled with. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, show me how this is going to be better for the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Uh, show me a roadmap. Show me how this is going to be linked to measurable outcomes. I'm a science guy. Tell me how this is going to be linked mm -hmm. in a way that we can prove that this has been worthwhile, the effort. And you can tie it to any measure you want. Infant mortality rate, lifespan, chronic disease, immunisation rates, domestic violence, whatever. There, are, there, there is a myriad of, of, of parameters you can introduce to measure. Tell me that this is going to be better. This is a longer pathway to improving those outcomes. Well, you talked about looking for a, a voice of a proponent. You're sitting next to one of the strongest yeah. ones. Kirsty. I might uh, get well, you to, if you want to respond to well, that. I, I would suggest that um, the sort of information that you're asking for is out there. Even if you haven't read it of late, you cannot argue with the fact that when you listen to people about how their lives are impacted by things and you say to them, can you tell me what would work in your circumstance um, and then if you take up their suggestions, you will probably get a better result. So there's a lot of discussion about, you know, and talking down the prospects of the referendum. And as I say, I'm an optimist. I'm very hopeful. I think the Australian uh, public will rise to the occasion. Um, but to, you know, really obsess about the strategies and the tactics, and we have seen it throughout this. You know, we've seen an extraordinary number of polls where pollsters are falling over themselves to rise, you know, to the top of the polling heap and to be able to say, this is what we found. So Australians are being buffeted by uh, being asked about these questions. How are you voting? How are you voting? Rather than the focus genuinely being on the situation at hand. So, I mean, I'm saddened that, um, you know, there are some people that are... Um, determining to vote no, because it means to me they are quite comfortable with the status quo that impacts on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Extraordinary statistics, horrific, catastrophic statistics within our community. So if you need any reminders, you might look at the Productivity Commission's recent review, three-year review of the Closing the Gap um, strategy, which all governments are leaning into with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And of those, only four of those 19 targets are on track. There are four that are going backwards and they relate to our adults in prison, um, the um, take up of Indigenous languages, the removal of our children from our families and the suicide rate amongst our children and our adults, which is already between two and three times that of the rest of the population. So if you are happy with those figures and that um, trajectory, um, then I expect that people will vote no. But if you care about it and if you listen to the viewpoints of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are hoping, despite the rights to be cynical and hoping against hope about that history has an opportunity to change, then I hope that you will take a different view. Well, well Kirsty, I want all those changes as well. I hate the fact that our kids are still being taken away. You know, I'm over 70. That's still, that's still happening. Mm -hmm. But I want solid, rock-solid guarantee that the government is actually going to say, yes, you have all your rights in place now. You can protect your kids, you can protect your country, you can protect your animals, you can have all of this. But at the moment, all they're going to say is, oh, we listen to you. Um, the way to be more certain that governments will respond in a way that responds to our concerns is for Australians to turn out in force and tell governments, this government and future governments, that we want you to do things differently. And that is the opportunity that is presented by the First Nations Voice to Parliament. Well, speaking of voices, uh, South Australia, where we are, is the first state in the country to have an enshrine a state-based Indigenous voice to Parliament. So what does it look like? And what can it tell us about how a national voice might work? The Drums' David Taylor has a look. We stand here with our feet firmly on the lands of the Kaurna people. The South Australian Premier, Peter Malinowskis, stands to address hundreds of voice enthusiasts. He's just passed a law paving the way for a voice to Parliament. But in our deeds. It's the first state in the nation to legislate an Indigenous voice to Parliament. For from today, in this state, their voices will be heard. 
Peter Malinowskis took the state voice proposal to the election in March last year. He told South Australians that his government would be committed to responding in full to the Uluru Statement from the Heart, and that includes a voice to Parliament. We see the voice as being an important vehicle to not just right wrongs of the past, but more importantly put us on a path to reconciliation that makes a practical difference to the standard of living for Indigenous people. Those of the opinions say aye, aye. against no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. So what would a South Australian First Nations voice do? The government says the South Australian First Nations voice will be a direct and independent line of communication for First Nations people to South Australia's parliament and the government. Practically, it would present its views to the state parliament through written reports. It would also meet with cabinet and attend briefings with heads of department at least twice a year. The very nature of the voice to the parliament is that it is free to express its view to the parliament and the government of the day. And then, of course, it'll be up to the government of the day to form its own view in response to that particular piece of advocacy. That's what it will do, but what will the voice look like? Well, South Australia is divided into six regions, each with a local First Nations voice. In each region, South Australian First Nations people will vote for two members to make up their local First Nations voice. Those two local members will also go to form the state voice. That means it will have 12 members drawn from the local voices. We're not going to come in there and say, OK, move out of the way, it's our turn. No. You know, we, we have to work together. And that's, that's, the, that's how it should have been in the first place. The inaugural First Nations voice election was meant to be held this month, but the SA government, in consultation with the Indigenous community, recently made the decision to delay that till March next year, in order to give the process some space from the fractious national conversation. South Australian First Nations people will be able to nominate as a candidate for their local voice between January 22 and February 12 next year. So, Tori, how was the voice greeted here, the South Australian voice greeted here? Uh, it was a relatively smooth process here compared to what we're seeing now federally. I mean, partly because, you know, we weren't changing the constitution. It was a legislative change. Um, it went very smoothly. I was at the uh, extraordinary sitting of parliament where, where the legislation went through and I was, I was commenting on it for the, for the crowd and I sort of went, oh, I didn't even hear a single voice of dissent in the chamber. I heard later they, they were, they were just sort of quite quiet. So my theory is that there wasn't enough time and perhaps not the inclination to build up the sort of culture wars that we're seeing now. There wasn't um, maybe that kind of, you know, match thrown on the bonfire. We didn't have the real adversarial conversations that we're seeing now. We didn't see the, you know, the social media filling up with the misinformation and disinformation. I'm sure it was all happening a little bit, but certainly it was a much smoother process than this. And now, of course, that's had to be the enact enactment of that is you know, briefly shelved while we go through this federal process. And it's a, it's a shame because Premier Peter Malinowskis was at one point saying, you know, we can use this as a model to show to people there's nothing to be, we, nothing to be afraid of and we can show that it can be effective and, you know, that will help because obviously he's a, he's a big advocate of the, um, of the yes vote at the federal level. That will show people how it can work which now we won't because it was getting too confusing. And that delay was about ensuring <laughs> that there wasn't a blurring of the lines, I think, the, you know, the waters were starting to muddy up a little bit and the idea of having the South Australian one already working at the same time we were debating the federal one, you can see how that would muddy things up. I think it was probably a political decision to just, like, South Australia, just, just put this off to the side for a bit while we get the federal one done. Mm. So how do you feel about the South Australian voice? Well... With the South Australian voice, I've just about begged for protection of country. You know, you've got miners, rocket launchers, all insisting on destroying country and animals, and I've pretty much begged for protection for these places. Like I said, I've talked and talked, and there is nobody listening. Um, the voice to me, I'm sorry, but the voice to me is not everything. We actually need solid guarantees that we can be 
ourselves, be Aboriginals, live on country, look after our kids, take out, you know, go do our bush tucker stuff like I'm always doing with kindy kids and, you know, really being us. But we haven't got that guarantee. And the voice, fair enough, you can go up to Parliament and talk to them. I've already, like I said, I've already done that and it's got me nowhere. That my country's been given away to rocket launchers and miners with no, no respect for the animals that live on it or any respect for our sacred sites that are out there. It's just like uninhabited country. Blow it up. But no, I'm going to be fighting this and if the voice is not offering me a rock solid guarantee, then I don't want to know. So is it, are you fight, you're fighting to be heard. You want the voice to listen to you. That's, yes. Is that what you're saying there? Yes. And to, you know, like, give us what we need, what I'm asking for anyway, and I guess a lot of other Aboriginal people are asking for the same, same sort of thing. Give us a guarantee that you're going to help us protect that country, not take, take the sides of the big corporates and the money people, you know, because we don't have the money and they just want to rape the land and we're trying to protect our culture for the future generations. And while we're fighting with the government, the mining's going on, the rockets are going off. You know, the destruction is still happening. So I really want rock-solid guarantee that they can stop all of this and give us a little bit of Australia. It's not a lot. Just give us a little bit of Australia to carry on our cultural way of life. Kirsty, uh, what have you made of the, the South Australian voice? Um, well, I, I just want to address what Sue has said first of all, and that is to say that every single Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person living within South Australia has a right to have their individual voice heard. But it is a fact that when you stand alongside other people that know your struggles, know your challenges and understand, you and if you're able to speak um, with the um, might of that collective force, you are more powerful. So. What um, Sue is talking about here, I think, is a perfect reason why um, a voice is needed at every level. Um, we're talking here about the South Australian voice, and you know that process um, was undertaken. And as Tori said, it was relatively, you know, pain-free, which I think is a blessing. Um, but there is um, there is no doubt that governments need to listen to us at every level. Um, and we can do that much better collectively. It's a, it's a fact, you know, the, the, for Australians and South Australians to come out, and we're talking here about what will happen in South Australia, but for South Australians to come out in force and say, we want you to listen to Aboriginal people, for any government receiving that message, you would have to think they would think twice about ignoring the voices of Aboriginal people. The individual voices of our people will be taken up through the process as into the state voice and then hopefully at a federal level if the if the federal re referendum gets up um, and you know it's our greatest hope I know that people are despondent I know that people are um, disappointed and they have every right to be but I know that my ancestors would be saying to me sorry I've just brushed my microphone it was probably loud for the <laughs> viewers but my ancestors would be saying to me do not give up you need to back our people, and to me, that's what the voice is at the state level and at the federal level. Mm. Sam, what, what have you made of the uh, South Australian voice? Um, I, I, um, I'm just reflecting on, a, on an old quote. Uh, it says, no matter how good the strategy, one should occasionally glance at the results. I think the fact that there are undecided voters like me uh, that are, understand the information is out there, but I'm not the proponent. It is the responsibility of the proponents to convince me, not for me to go and search for where that bit of information is. Um, I think the fact that there, are, there has been growth in those undecided voters um, uh, uh, is food for thought. On the other side, those that are advocating for a no vote just need to, just need to turn the. That they have got an opportunity to convince me and all those that are searching for more truth. They say, show me how a no vote is going to make. Rather than saying, well, no is going to be bad, just turn it into a more constructive conversation. Show me how a no vote is going to be better for the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Show me how 
if we say no, things are going to be better and they have not engaged in a constructive conversation like that. I think key to, key, key to the no advocates also is to, here's a great opportunity to say, well, if this referendum in the way that it is being proposed is not the perfect way to advocate for the betterment of lives for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, well, here's your opportunity to turn it into something more constructive. How would you like the question posed? What would you like to be connected with that question to, to, to favour, to get your favour? Mm. I mean, the, the, it's not just about saying no or yes. We've got a, a great platform. You know, like I said, the light is on the subject. It's a great opportunity for both sides of the debate to engage at a much higher level to say, well, if this isn't the perfect way to ask the question, what is? Let's come up with a perfect way to ask the question. And I'm not hearing that conversation. I'm not hearing it in a clear enough form. Again, there's a wonderful saying that says, if you can't, if you can't explain it well enough, you don't understand it. And this is the other way around. For somebody yeah, listening... It might have been Einstein who said, said yeah, that. Is. You just don't understand it enough. It is. Chris, I just want to wrap this tiny bit with you. Uh, I think you wanted to respond. Well, I, I have to say the question has been decided. The question is out there. It is a matter of yes or no. And um, we are hopeful on my side of you know, support for the First Nations voice that Australians will now um, think about this very deeply and if they think about the sort of country that they want us to be. Australians are very fond of saying that we are fair and decent and that we will um, give people a hand when they need one. Well, now is an opportunity for that. This is an unprecedented opportunity that will certainly not come within our lifetimes and perhaps never again for us to do something that builds us as a united Australia. And I've said this week that on the other side of a successful referendum, we will be much more able to meet each other's gaze without flinching. We will know that we have treated each other with decency and dignity and we are in a space to have these difficult conversations, but we've sent a message to each other that we see each other. I want to go to the tone of the debate because the National Crisis Helpline for First Nations people is fielding a record number of calls of people telling counsellors that they're experiencing racism and abuse as a result of this voice debate. 13 Yarn was launched last year and was expected to take about 30 calls a day. Well, last Tuesday, volunteers took 173 calls. The National Program Manager at 13 Yarn, Artie Marge Anderson, says people are telling counsellors that they're struggling to carry the load. Look, I think people are seeing more racism on social media um, and and that's having an impact on individuals. And also um, with everything else that's going on with financial hardships and other things going on in people's lives, it's easy to become overwhelmed. And they talk about um, just needing to vent um, to somewhere that's culturally safe and somewhere without judgment. And that's why they ring 13 Yarn. And often at the end of the call, they'd say, I just feel better that I've been heard. So Aboriginal people are not feeling heard at the moment. Sue, I want to start with you uh, first on this one. What's the tone of the debate like in your community, Sajuna? Um, there's a lot of people that are unsure. Like, there's non-Aboriginal people actually on the streets of Sajuna asking Aboriginal people, what do they think? What's your opinion? And the Aboriginal people, most of them are saying, well, we don't know. We don't know anything about the voice. And others are saying no, and some are saying yes. So it's well and truly, you know, it's divided. But for the people to actually come and ask the Aboriginal people, which is something the government may have thought they did something like that, like, but when, pe when government people come to Aboriginal areas, they mostly go to CEOs and councils. They do not go to the grassroots people. And that's where, that's where a lot of the problem is. The grassroots people are jacking up and saying, nobody spoke to us, nobody told us about this. Where are we supposed to stand? Who's listening? You know? mm. Kirsty, what are you seeing about the, the, the tone? Because you've touched on it, you've written a bit about some of that and you've, and you've touched on that tonight, about some of the nastiness, the horrible stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised by the statistic you talked about by um, to the extent to which our people are um, suffering in this climate. It has been a terrible chapter in Australian history and um, I'm not going to try and you know politicise it or 
um, be overtly critical of others on the other side, although I think it would be warranted. Um, but we have seen really reprehensible things said about our people. This is why our people are accessing mental health services. We have seen um, jokes made at high profile conferences attended by parliamentarians. Um, we have seen a walking back of things saying, for example, a former Prime Minister saying, I'm just getting a bit sick of welcomes to country when we know that these are a gesture of respect for our people. So um, the thing that I cannot take is when people refuse to allow our people to have dignity, making jokes about us, making demeaning comments. This is the sort of thing that upsets our people. Why wouldn't it after all that we have been through? On the other side of that, as I say, I think Australians have an opportunity that they will now take. They will want to say to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, we don't always agree, um, you know, we give each other the irrits from time to time, um, and we need to have some real genuine conversations, but I actually see you, and I believe that you have a right, like every other Australian, to dignity. Tori, we've seen some of the, the politics of this has been absolutely fraught. There was that hot mic incident where Linda Burney said that her treatment in Parliament was pretty shocking and, and pretty average. I mean, she went much harder than that. How much of that is setting the tone of what is acceptable in the community? Well, you know, they talk about the Overton window kind of getting pushed out so that more things become acceptable. And I feel like that happened long ago and has continued to happen. Um, Yes, it happens on social media, but we have seen very prominent people say some really appalling things in this debate. I would like to say I've talked to people who've been out campaigning who are saying every day they are having much more respectful, uh, low-key conversations. Of course, it's always the loud ones who get all of that focus. Um, and then, of course, we have this huge logical fallacy in a lot of this debate where people are saying it's so divisive, we shouldn't be having it whereas the divisiveness is coming from the racist comments and so on. So it's kind of, you know, a, a shifting of blame that's further muddying the waters, which I think is helping the No campaign inject that fear and doubt into, into people's minds. Um, but again, you know, we saw some protesters yell some things at Senator Alex Antic this week. We can have a bit of proportionality about this. You know, that was two, three people shouting things at a senator. It's not... That's kind of not emblematic of what... The entire Yes campaign is like by, by any means at all and it's not equivalent to having a public figure who is a leader in a campaign saying something appalling mm. like we heard from the other side. And I, I wonder if you've thought about the broader way the media covers a big debate like this. The media always struggles with knowing how to tune, you know, tune out some of that noise and get to the heart of things. I think it's really hard. I think we've certainly seen some elements of the media blowing up comments that suit their particular... You know, we saw some big attacks on Marsha Langton, of course, this week and so on. Where, where her, her word, the comments she made were and about the campaign. Absolutely misquoted. And then they were twisted and so on. To, yeah. to be And again, people. it's a proportionality. You know, who said it? Does it deserve to be on the front page? Is it representative of the movement as a whole? And sometimes we just need to pack that back in and look at the broader picture of where it's going and focus on the actual debate that's going on instead of the, the, the shouting from the sidelines. Kirsty, you were a journalist for a long time. Oh, we first met when you were editing the Courier Mail. Yeah, I have to agree with that. There has been an absolute obsession amongst the media pinning people to the wall. Our mob, non-Indigenous people saying, how are you going to vote? How are you going to vote? Whereas the focus could have been on what is this about? What is the nation being asked to do at this time? And I can speak only for myself, and people say it's been extraordinarily divisive, and I agree it has been, but unnecessarily so. If someone said to me, would you rather that um, the Uluru Statement from the Heart didn't happen, that Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people did not ask Australia to show up for them, would you rather that? And the answer is an emphatic no. I think this is a conversation that Australia needed to have a long time ago. We have that opportunity now and we can't miss it. Mm. Um, Tori, uh, today we saw the new online social emotional wellbeing resource being launched uh, for the remainder of this voice referendum. Led by Nacho, with CEO Pat Turner saying, quote, we're witnessing firsthand the adverse consequences of this debate within our communities. So what's the message then to those key people that are using language that is dividing and that is attacking people? Let's stop it. 
<laughs> yeah, I realise that it sounds overly simple. And, uh, you know, there's not a direct parallel, but I keep thinking about the same-sex marriage plebiscite where, again, individuals were targeted, the bigotry was on full display, and then people said, see, it's such a controversial, divisive thing. It's like, well, no, don't, don't do the controversial, divisive things. Mm. <laughs> you know, keep them to yourselves. Try and, you know, display just a moderate level of civility. We can't do a lot about social media. God knows a lot of people are trying. But at that leadership level, when people you know, have a public profile, they have a public platform, um, there are things that have been said that you know we haven't heard since maybe Marbo sort of yeah. times. Um, and I think that's been a real shame and shame on those who've done it. Yeah, there was something that uh, Lowitra O'Donoghue said about that time, that we during that debate we saw the best and the worst of Australia. I can't help thinking that that is happening now. So I saw you were, you were nodding along agreeing about the tone and, and the role of politicians and the media and people that are prominent. What's your view on all of that? People who are prominent politicians? I don't know. Maybe I'm just a m mistrusting person. But un un until they can really show respect, really, that, that's a word that's not used much. Respect for my culture, my people, the animals. I'm always on about the animals. Because well, nobody, they can't speak it's for themselves. It's Somebody else has to. So yeah, when when all that respect can come out for all of us, maybe, and really be truthful about the respect, not just tokenism stuff. Mm. Maybe things can work out better. But there's so much tokenism going on, and people just saying what they think we want to hear, and then doing nothing about it. Mm. Um, I just have to make the point that um, this is exactly why what we've seen happening within the parliament and some very unseemly behaviour. Um, this is why our people presented the Uluru Statement from the heart to the Australian people. Because we knew we were asking for a constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament so that there was no use by date or expiry date on respect and dignity for our people. And it's to the Australian people that we are talking now. Politicians have had their say. There's been to and fro. It's been pretty um, um, messy and I think not um, um, illustrative of the sorts of respectful conversations that we need to have with everyday Australians. If you need more information, there are lots of places to go and get it. And also, fundamentally, listen to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, their varied voices, um, and make your decisions based on that. Yeah, well, we are right out of time tonight. And, and I just want to uh, mention that in the frame of this discussion, if you need to speak to someone called 13 Yarn or Lifeline. That is all we have time for. Thank you so much to our panel, Sue Hazeldean, Kirsty Parker, Sam Shane and Tori Shepherd. Have an excellent evening. Julia Baird will be back with you tomorrow night. Good night.